I think people would go to extreme lengths to present an identity of themselves online uh, that is uh, perhaps overcurated. When we're told that our online reputation is more powerful than money, more powerful than trust, and all of these other virtues in society, we start to realize the value that's being poured into online identities. There are companies now specializing in reputation management. Should I create a profile? What should it look like? How can I ensure against bad commentary online? And so the online world becomes a commodity in itself. And big companies like Facebook, LinkedIn, they all know this. Companies don't exist because they just like us and they want us to be able to share what we're doing today or report. They're making lots and lots of money from people who are addicted to social media or the internet in general. So we have to ask ourselves, what kinds of different people are on this platform? How are they using it and how are they manipulating sentiment as a result? So if my product is myself and I invest in myself in an online capacity because I know that's going to make me more money, then I can go to any limit. You know, I might change the color of my eyes. I might change my nose. Um, I might do something to my teeth. I might make myself look thinner. And a lot, a lot of people through the photoshopped environment um, are doing that. Young people are actually disfiguring themselves, I would call it, because they're not happy with their own skin. And so this becomes an amplified problem where I'm not happy with myself because you're trying to outdo, uh, outdo the next person every time or outdo yourself. So I had four likes today. You know, if I remove my top, will I get 40 likes? And then what? So after I've removed and changed my face and my body, presented myself in contexts which are not real, perhaps even lied, and this is very common, people who are addicted to Facebook are compulsive liars, amplified by the fact that they're trying to outdo every report that they actually create about themselves. So if I went to Chile and then I went and climbed the highest mountain in Peru and then, well, then what? You've climbed the highest mountain, you look brilliant, you look beautiful, you know, I, I change myself and then I get to a point where I think, well, what else can I do? Well, okay, maybe I can take off my clothes and I'll get more likes. Maybe I can win that online social media game and, you know, get legend status and then after legend status, then what? So we're never happy because there's always another milestone to reach. And this is exactly what's occurring in the massively open online game, gaming platforms. There is no winner. There is no end. You know, once upon a time, 20 years ago, when I was playing games, no, 30 years ago, when I was playing games, when I was in uh, late primary school, the games had an end. Maybe they went for seven levels. And at level seven, you'd be hit by all the helicopter firing and shooting and whatever else. Everything would come at you and either you'd die because you had three lives or you'd keep going, mastering it or press the hotkey to get to the end, but you'd win. Today, there is no winner. You're stuck in this online vortex, which says you've got to keep going, 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 get more ranking, 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 higher, 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 higher. But to what? Like, can I be different to what extent? Okay, I can modify my ears, my nose, my eyes, the color of my eyes, my hair. I can have a million different haircuts. Okay. And I can get legend status and I can go into Call of Duty and I can do this and I can go into World of Warcraft and have 17 avatars and spend out of 365 days, 200 whole days on, on, on World of Warcraft. And then what? I'm still not happy. So the game continues. And one of the reasons why we have these very sad fatalities in South Korea is because there is no end to the game. And I have spoken to people of Korean background and culture. I've spoken to people in the China context. One of my portfolios is actually traveling for the University of Wollongong and, and meeting people in different universities throughout the world. And part of the problem in Asia is that you lose face if you get off the game early and you can't lose face, you can't lose. You're not supposed to lose. And so the young people who have been taught about better, 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 excelling, better mathematics results, better results overall, 
do something with your life. Come on, you know, help China lift economically. Well, they're just stuck in the same mentality when it comes to gaming. And when their parents tell them, get off the computer and start studying at 11 p.m., 11 p.m., the child says, but hang on a second, you've taught me all my life to keep going, to perfect, to get it perfect. Well, we can't be perfect. We're human. And Facebook's certainly not going to make us perfect. And so we don't want to lose face, so we keep going. And to our detriment, to our self-harm, because we're never happy. We're never content. We always want the extra bells and whistles. The way the neuroscientists describe this, one of the ways uh, people have described this social media addiction is by going back to the first game, Pong. Pong had a counter moving from left to right, and you'd have to block it in order to keep going in the game, a bit like a tennis rally. This is exactly what happens in social media. I send the message. I expect a response. I send another message. I expect more responses. I send another message. I expect even more responses. But what happens when those responses don't come? I get angry. I get frustrated. I get anxious. I keep looking. I can't close Facebook. I get upset. And so in the middle of the night, I'm thinking, has someone sent me a message? Does someone love me? And if it's not the someone love me, it's the dopamine working in your brain. It's the amygdala getting excited in your body. It's the dorsal medial prefrontal cortex going, oh, ac action, activity. And we're creatures of, of relation. We're, we're, we're not, you know, no man is an island. We want to be with others. And so I get excited. The dopamine kicks in like drugs. I want somebody to rally back, hit the ball back to me. And so I wake up and I think, oh, you know, the phone underneath my pillow. Oh, the phone, it's got to come with me to the toilet. Oh, the phone. I wonder if I could click into this and that. Oh, it doesn't matter that my work's waiting for me. No one will worry that I'm spending like over half my daytime at work on Facebook when I should be doing the projects. Oh, my work's suffering. I'm sorry, we're going to fire you. Oh, you know, family, guess what? Four kids. I can't feed you now. I'm still addicted. And so this plays out in everyday life and quite successful people can be easily addicted. It's not people who are less educated. In fact, I would say it's the reverse. My parents, who are less educated, have never touched a computer. They get on fantastically in the real world together. They make things together. They cook in the real world. They don't need a game to go and show them how to do MasterChef. They practice and they chop. But our children chop online cucumbers, just in case they get a, a scratch. And so we have people in everyday society today who can write wonderful academic papers, for example, wonderful journal papers, and can't change a tire. So we're losing our practical skills because we're waiting for the ping pong to come back. And I'm so engrossed in the ping pong ball. And you know what? I've lost all of re I've lost all the depths of reality as a result. But what's changed, and this is what we've been writing about in our papers, is that once upon a time when these arcade games came in, because it's all about the dopamine response, they used to be locked up in things called shops and you had to put 50 cents in or 25 cents in when we were younger to play another game. And at five o'clock, the owner would say, you know what, guys, we're closing the shop, go home. Now they can say that to you and you go home and you just open up your Xbox or you just get on your phone and you get on your other device. And before you know it, on average in the U.S., People are spending 11 and a half hours in front of screens out of 24. They're spending a fifth of their, their time at work on non-related internet work. It's not work. It's play. It's addiction. So think about productivity losses. Think about the time we could have spent talking to each other, playing a game of soccer, writing something on a piece of paper, reflecting, praying, making love. That's all gone out the window. And if we want to look at why birth rates are falling as fast as they're falling in Asia, it's simple. People are spending more time on screens, even when they're lying down next to each other in a bed. Less people actually have a partner. That's been proven. In Japan, for example, people go to consultants to learn how to touch each other again. And there are consultants who go, now I'm going to touch you. Don't jump. Don't be scared. It's a human quality. It's a human reaction. So we're busy quantifying our lives. Quantity, 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 ranks, 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 higher up, legend status. 
more likes, more posts, more instant messages, more text messages. We're forgetting about quality. We're forgetting about living. We're forgetting about being human. And the way we were created by our parents and by other, another higher force, which I name as God, we were created as continuous analog signals. We have become like computers, discrete. We message, we get a message back. We message, we get a message back. Where's this conversation going? I'm talking to you, you talk back to me. I'm not a computer. Stop talking to me like an AI machine. And yet our children, our two-year-olds, and this is highly reported on YouTube by the parents who have allowed their children or succumbed to the pressures or have been controlled by the innovation tech companies. The children of parents go, I want iPad faster than they say, I want mummy. Who cares about mummy going out the door, going to work? Give me the iPad. This morning I was in a store. I overhead, overheard that very same conversation. Two women talking about how difficult it was to leave their children this morning because they had to go to work. And one says, you know what I just did? I just gave him the iPad. That's all he wanted. He wanted the iPad. He didn't want mummy. He wanted the iPad. This morning, repeated views of this in, on YouTube. And some parents even play games. They think it's so funny that they say, because they think they're going to get more hits on YouTube. So they're going to make money, you know, from their kid going, crying their guts out. Oh, you want iPad? You want the iPad? No, I'm not going to give you the iPad. You want the iPad? No, I no, I'll give it to the dog. I won't give it to you. You want iPad? No, I'll put it up on the, on the highest shelf. And the more that they can get a reaction out of the child, and they're filming with their own camera, the greater the hits on YouTube. It's nuts.